Welcome everyone. My name is Carlos and I'm really excited to be here to, uh, with you again. In today's talk, we are going to get an introduction to optimization algorithms for compressing neural networks. And we have the great pleasure to have Marcus uh, Rupp from the Han Schickard Research Institute to guide us um, to this topic. The TinyML Foundation is supported by sponsors and first of all, ARM is the TinyML strategic partner. And specifically, um, these TinyML talks, like the one we are, we are in today, um, we also have sponsors like uh, DeepLight, Kitso, Edge Impulse, Reality AI, Maxim Integrated, and Syncense. If anyone else is interested in sponsoring opportunities, either for our local talks, uh, talks here in, in Germany or, or globally, uh, well, feel free to, to join to talk to Betty at tinyml.org. And as you probably know, there are regular TinyML talks. And the next one is uh, on, on next week on Tuesday. Generally, they happen at the same time, 8 a.m. in Pacific time, which translates here in, in Central Europe at 5 in the afternoon, which is uh, great, uh, just after our um, fire event in Germany, after um, our work. So fits very well with the time. And yes, as I mentioned uh, here in the tiny ML local meetup um, in, in Germany, we have a small organizing committee composed of uh, these three people we are currently seeing in the screen. We started just some months ago uh, with this uh, local tiny ML group to try to connect experts in academia and the industry. And well, for now, uh, the format is these online talks we have, but uh, we hope that uh, anytime soon with this uh, COVID, um, we can meet in person and, and do uh, meetups uh, some, somewhere where we can uh, talk uh, in person. And Alexis Weinachter, he's not in the line, so I present him. He is the first uh, of the um, three um, uh, persons in the committee. So he's a master's degree in control engineering a senior field application engineer working for Infineon with 32 bits uh, microcontrollers for sensors, fusion, and control. From my side, I'm the second one, Carlos. I'm, I work as a software project manager for the development of IoT devices at uh, RoboBoss in the south of Germany. And in addition to that, I spent, well, quite a lot of my private time in the evenings and also in the weekends doing some research in deep learning applications for IoT devices and also public cloud innovations, etc. cetera. Um, Daniel, did you want to present yourself? No, hi everyone, uh, welcome. So I'm Daniel, um, I'm coming from the academic side. So I'm a professor at the Technical University of Munich. Um, they have a research group. We do a lot of system modeling and um, now we're also doing a CAT support for TinyML. So I'm also very interested in this topic. Thank you. As I mentioned during the opening, today we have the pleasure to have with us Markus Rupp. Markus has researched during the last couple of years in the area of AI and embedded systems. And it is therefore for him, we can say his bread and butter um, to perform uh, experiments for compressing neural networks. So Markus, with this, the stage is yours. As we discussed, uh, I will interrupt you, but not too much. <laughs> so if there are questions which uh, we can place uh, in, in some of the topics you are explaining, I will try to put them in the context or otherwise we discuss them at the end. Okay, thank you very much, Carlos. And yeah, um, good evening or good morning, depends where you stay um, from my side. And like um, Carlos mentioned, um, please ask whenever you um, have a question and yeah, so um, like Carlos mentioned, I am Markus Rieb, a researcher at Hans Schickert Institute um, in Germany. And yeah, today I want to talk about a little bit introduction to optimization algorithm to compress neural networks. Um, yeah, I show you some um, algorithm to compress neural networks, but um, this is more for everybody who has um, is a beginner in this topic, and um, I go doesn't go that 
deep so uh, that everybody kind of understands what I'm talking about today. So yeah, what I want to talk about to do to you today, um, first I want to um, discuss with you what is TinyML and why does we need this? Um, then what is quantization? I want to uh, talk a little bit about knowledge distillation, about pooling and three other methods. Um, I give a short look today uh, about this and in the end I summary everything. So yeah. Um, Oh, no, everything is jumping. So what is um, TinyML or um, HI, like um, I often call it, and why does uh, do I need this? Um, tiny machine learning, um, the long version is the uh, lastest embedded software technology. Um, it's about making computing at the edge cheaper, less expensive, and more predictable. And so, yeah, for example, HII or TinyML is um, artificial intelligent uh, who runs on a microcontroller, an FPGA, or we can imagine, for example, uh, mobile phones or smartphones um, can put in this area. Yeah, we can put in this area. So um, we does not run this on big computers or servers loud, uh, like the cloud AI. So everything is local and the data stay there where the uh, data is, um, yeah, so we, where we made the data. The benefits of TinyML um, is we have more privacy um, because we must not send the data um, in some server or some big computers. Um, it's more energy saving um, because we have smaller devices. Um, there is a lower latency. Uh, we have a lower latency because we does not send um, the data somewhere else and must compute it and send the um, answer back. And in general, we need a lot uh, less more communication um, and because we does not send the data somewhere else and we uh, can do um, uh, feature engineering on the microcontroller or on the embedded device. So where are the fields of application or why does we need this? Uh, the fields of application of uh, TinyML are really widespread. Uh, for example, we have mobile application in the medical technology like pacemaker. Uh, we have um, in the production, something like predictive maintenance. We can use it in mechanical engineering uh, in the robotic um, part or end products. Um, can use it in with IoT devices, you can imagine, and smart uh, fridge or something like this. So, yeah, um, the like we saw, uh, TinyML is really important, and we can use it in different application. Uh, but the problem is AI and neural networks get more and more. Comp uh, the problem AI and neural networks get more and more complicated and um, with the more and more complex problem, we get bigger and bigger models. And the large models, um, however, lead us to an obs uh, obstacle. Um, embedded devices are limited in memory and computing power. So the solution is obvious. Um, we have to compress the model and unfortunately um, compression has an uh, some consequences. Uh, one of the consequences, we entering a trade off between compression rate and the accuracy. Um, yeah, and this techniques and about this trade off, I want to um, show you a little bit more. So the first technique uh, is called quantization. So what is quantization? Here I copied a really good sentence from Wikipedia. Quantization is the process of constraining an input from a continuous or otherwise large set of values, such as the real numbers to a discrete set, um, such as the integer. So on the right, we can see a continuous uh, sinus signal. And with um, um, and here we discretize it uh, with a quantization to, um, so we must not save that much values or that much uh, numbers, but it does not get so smooth like the, uh, normal sinus. So how we can use this in neural networks? So the basic idea is um, to 
um, get from the normal weights uh, we storage, for example, uh, 46 bits or 42 uh, bit variables, uh, we reduce the bit write um, to go to 16 bits and float or for example, 12 bit um, fixed point, or we can go uh, to 8 bit integer or some extreme cases, we can go to a binarization of the network um, and uh, so we can save a lot of memory. Uh, so to make it a little bit clearer, um, here an example. So you can see on the left and right matrix uh, with four, four, um, with the dimension of four or four. And the first step is to um, sort the weights and cluster them. Um, after after we cluster them, we can quantize the parameter. Um, in this case, we quantize them in a range from minus one to uh, two. And um, after we um, quantize the networks, we must retrain the whole network to um, go against the error we put on the network and get um, the accuracy higher um, after the quantization. Yeah, um, in quantization, uh, we have a special case, it's uh, called Huffman coding. Um, in Huffman coding, the idea is uh, to encode the values into low bit representations. So um, for the matrix, we can see, um, we does not um, must use um, for the two bits um, values um, or um, float values, so we can um, cluster them into two-bit representations of the values. The problem with this uh, thing is, or the good thing is we can really, really compress the networks uh, into really small um, footprints. And the problem we get is that we need a lot of more um, computational, computational energy because we need to um, encode the weights for the calculation. There's um, some case where it can be really good. For example, when, you, when we implement it on hardware, for example, FPJs, then we can do, um, uh, we can calculate um, when there's um, good representation of the values with the low bit variant. So the next, uh, so, we come to the pros and cons of quantization. So the pros of quantization is we can um, apply it on both during and after the training. Uh, we can apply it on nearly every layer and we can improve the inference time and the model size. And, um, but we have uh, with the quantization, the trade-off of the accuracy because we get the lower representation of the, bit, uh, of the um, weights. The cons, um, con points are the quantization rates um, make neural networks harder to converge. That means uh, it's harder to train a neural network, which is quantized. And um, the learning rate must be really small to ensure the network have a good performance. So it does a, take um, a lot of longer to train a quantized neural network. And um, like I mentioned, the quantized rates make it hard to make a backpropagation algorithm. So um, we cannot dis uh, take the backpropagation algorithm with the discrete rates. We must uh, always save both rates in the training. At one time the quantized rates and on the other side the um, normal rates to um, done the um, backpropagation algorithm. So if you want to dive a little bit deeper um, in this topic, I write here three links. So one good paper, and then the TensorFlow implementation of um, uh, quantization and a really good framework, QKeras, uh, which is really flexible and you can uh, quantize the neural networks um, with the uh, bit rate you want to um, um, yeah, you want to have. And so it's yeah, pretty, um, Good and uh, for example, I use this by myself. So let's come to the next algorithm. Uh, the next algorithm I want to uh, show is the knowledge distillation. Um, in 
knowledge distillation, a large and complex model is trained on the large data set. And when this large model can generalize and perform well on unseen data, um, this knowledge we want to transfer on a smaller network. The larger model is also known as the teacher model. You can see on the image and the smaller network is uh, known as the student network. And um, the transfer, the transferring of the generalization ability of the cumbersome model um, to a small model can be done by use of the class probability produced by the cumbersome model as a soft target or, um, for training the small model. So for this transfer stage, we use the same training sort, set or separate uh, transfer set uh, as used for the training of the cumbersome model. And when the cumbersome model is a large ensemble of simpler models, we can use arithmetic or geometric mean of the inbuilt predictive distribution of the soft targets. So yeah, what is the main idea? After this, we put the, um, we have some input um, data set and run it over the teacher model and get some soft labels. Um, or we get the prediction of, of the model and this prediction we feed into the student network um, and uh, make a mixture of the soft prediction from the teacher model and the hard prediction from the student model and make the propagation algorithm backwards to uh, the student network to get um, the knowledge out of the teacher network. Yeah, um, uh, um, of course, uh, with a bigger uh, with a bigger size model, uh, the theoretically convergence area is um, or convergence space is a lot of larger than the smaller network. But um, in this technique, we assume that. Um, we assume that the convergence um, area can be um, the same convergence area can be achieved with the student network, um, like the teacher network. So um, we assume that the convergence area is um, overlapping. Unfortunately, uh, that alone does not guarantee um, for the student network at the same uh, convergence on the same location. The student network can have a convergence which might be hugely different from that of the teacher network. So that you can see on the picture I draw. So we have on one side um, the convergence area of the teacher, the convergence which is and inside is the student convergence area. And the um, solution convergence of the teacher is overlapping with the student's convergence. And with the soft labels uh, and the technique of um, large distillation I showed you in the um, slide before, we um, try to put the student solution um, or we force the student solution in the direction of the teacher solution. With this technique, we can uh, uh, comprise um, the models up to 20, uh, 20s uh, of a factor of 20. So, yeah, the pros and cons um, of knowledge distillation. Um, the pros are if you have a pre trained um, teacher network and uh, less training data for, the, for your problem, um, it can be really good to. Um, <clears throat> to distillate the knowledge from one network to the other network, uh, to the small network. Um, but on the other side is if you don't have that much um, data, it's hard to train a large network and after this to train a small network because uh, you need a lot of um, data and, uh, um, and it takes a lot of more time to train uh, both networks. Um, but uh, one other pros you can downsize a network uh, regardless of the structural difference between the teacher and the uh, student network. And uh, one other pro, uh, pro thing is we can um, do have one, uh, we have one teacher network which is an expert in different things and can um, generate of this, out of this teacher network um, a lot of small networks with our experts in um, different um, tasks. 
So um, here, um, like before, I give you two links um, where you one link is um, a really good um, implementation of null distillation in Keras, and the other thing is a good overview about null distillation and how to begin. The next technique, um, big technique I want to show you, and one of my favorite techniques is uh, pruning. Um, the idea from pruning is to reduce the numbers of parameters by removing redundant and unimportant connections um, that are not sensitive to the performance. And this not only helps to reduce the overall model size, but it also um, reduces the computational time and energy, and it um, helps the network to better generalize on problems. So in this case, we must uh, separate pruning into techniques. On one side, we have the structured pruning, and we have the unstructured pruning on the other side. So the unstructured pruning um, delete only connections between neural networks. Um, and not the whole neuron. The benefit of this is it's easy to implement, um, but the um, yeah, a not so good thing is uh, that on the most devices, we doesn't have uh, really speed up um, in the inference because we only um, set the weight to zero, but we uh, always must calculate the zero to um, the more interesting pruning technique for inference speed is the structured pruning. Here uh, we delete the whole neuron, like you can see on the white picture. Um, here the benefit is it's um, compress and speed up the model um, really. And uh, so yeah, it's really um, compress the model and give us a speed up because we really delete uh, weights and um, parameters out of the model. And yeah, not so good thing on the structured pruning is it's um, harder to implement and there are not many frameworks out uh, to make this um, happen. And we had a lack of um, matrix to um, get um, which no one gets to prune or not gets to prune. But more about this one slide after this. So what is the process of pruning? Um, the first step is we have an unpruned network. And the se second step is that we evaluate the importance of neurons. In this um, example, you can see it's easy to see uh, with the uh, smallest uh, value inside the neuron. And the third step is that we remove the least important neurons um, out of the magnitude scope. And after we remove the least important neurons, uh, we must retrain the network. And this can be done in a loop and we can prune it um, until we have um, a maximum um, accuracy loss or a minimum size of um, the network. So how uh, does we know which connections or neurons we have to prune? Here are some uh, really smart techniques um, developed by a researcher. One is the L1 or L2 mean. Um, the other thing, like in the example before, is the magnitude of the neuron. Um, then we can, for example, have <clears throat> the mean activation with an extra data set. So we um, have an extra data set and calculate it uh, through the, or inference it through the model and all um, always then, and we count how often our neuron gets activated. And this, um, and the neurons who get activated at least we can delete. And one um, matrix for the uh, convolutional layers is for example, the matrix similarity. So we uh, look okay, which matrix are really similar and which we can delete. So the pro and cons <coughs> sorry, of pruning is uh, we can apply it uh, during and after training. Uh, we can improve the inference time and model size and have here a new um, trade-off parameter uh, for the accuracy. And it can be applied on both convolutional and fully connected layers. And um, 
it gets us a better generalization for networks and we can have uh, we can privacy preserving the network um, because uh, the, the network doesn't um, learn the data um, completely and we, it's harder to extract the data from a network. Um, one um, minus thing is that unstructured pruning does not really speed up uh, inference on the most um, devices because we get a sparse network, which is hard to calculate on the, yeah, on the most um, devices. So um, yeah, if you want to def, uh, dive deeper in this topic, here's a um, paper um, like before, then I uh, have um, linked in the TensorFlow implementation. And on the, the last link is a framework, uh, which I uh, rewrote at Tanchikat um, by our own. Um, This is one, so yeah, uh, by our own, um, where you can structured pruning your networks. And um, yeah, it's, so it we you can, for example, write, okay, I want this network 10% smaller, and then everything gets automatically um, pruned. Or you can say, okay, um, I want um, prune the network until it gets 5% worse, the accuracy, then it prunes uh, it that much, um, how much, yeah, but, um, until the accuracy is reached. Yeah, um, let's come to three small techniques um, or yeah, special techniques uh, which can be used, but uh, not in every case. So one is the low end factorization. Uh, the idea in the low rank factorization is um, that there exist the 10 structures in the data by uncovering um, which we can obtain a compressed representation of the data. So, uh, um, this always jumps. I don't know why. Yeah, uh, the low rank matrix factorization. Um, factorize the original matrix into lower rank mat matrices uh, while preserving latent stru structures and addressing the issue of spanners. So convolutional operations are usually very computational intensive in deep um, convolutional neural networks, thus reducing the number of convolutional operations uh, would help us to compress the network as well, increase the overall speed up. And so, Low rank factorization can be done with um, the singular value decomposition, which give us free matrices, uh, uh, yeah, free matrices, uh, smaller matrices, and we can, for example, use two of them to represent the whole matrix. Um, one con point is um, often that we can save this in two smaller vectors and the uh, original matrix, but uh, we must decomposition um, the um, two vectors into a weight matrix. And this is um, yeah, a really computational expensive task. The next um, technique is the fast convolutional. So um, in the, instead of calculate the convolutional um, step by step, like it's normally done, we can um, transform the inputs and the filter kernel with an, with an FFT in the, into the frequency domain and calculate um, the output of this with a multiplication. So uh, when you, we use this technique and um, we pre-transform the kernel, filter kernels and only must um, transfer the input um, in, with an FFT to um, done the multiplication. After every um, after the multiplication is done, we must uh, we um, transform it into the um, time domain. Yeah, uh, there's a special case called Winograd convolutional. This is a really fast FFT implementation, but it uh, works only with even numbers of filter kernels. So, for example, two of two or four of four. Um, yeah, the fast convolutional is pretty good for hardware implementations. So like I mentioned on ASICs or FPGAs, it can be really fasten up the um, 
convolutional layers. But um, yeah, on microcontrollers, um, it's harder to get here really a benefit out of them. The next technique um, is um, the selective attention network. Um, so this technique um, is with the motto um, divide and conquer. So we have, for example, an image recognition where we train two networks. One network uh, give us the area of interest. For example, in the picture, you can see, okay, it uh, blur or it delete everything out of the image um, beside the person. And the second uh, network recognize the person or yeah, does the classification task uh, or whatever uh, done the second task. So with this case, we um, can have and speed up on two cases. And the first case is we hope that the two uh, networks are in general smaller than one. And the other thing is we have an um, pre-calculation. So we not we does not always to, uh, need to calculate the whole network or the whole algorithm. So we in, can use, um, for example, when on the image there is no person, we only must uh, use the first network and this gives us, okay, there is a person or there's no person. So yeah, to, to the summary, um, we learned um, three compromission methods um, and go deeper to them. This was one side quantization where we um, reduced the band, uh, bit rate, uh, bit rate of parameters. Then the knowledge distillation where we um, transfer the knowledge from one big network to a smaller network and the pruning where we um, cut the unimportant connections between neurons or delete uh, whole neurons. Um, yeah, what should you always um, take with the presentation that uh, network compression work and um, that we can compress the model models up to um, the factor of 20 of the original size. So yeah, if there are now any pr uh, questions, I can I'd be happy to answer them. Perfect. Thank you very, very much, Markus. Um, sorry, this is jumping all the time. Uh, it was a great, really great presentation. So before we go to the questions, I would like to um, open a poll for learning um, what do the participants, the, the people who has joined today, the audience, think about the presentation. And now we're going to go to the, um, to the questions. So the first one, the first question we have um, from the Q&A is coming from Paul. He is first of all thanking you for the great presentation and for the for sharing your experience. And he's um, interested in learning. So he uh, he means that um, there has been a lot of uh, talks about the theoretical part of, of uh, this what you have presented today. But he would be interested in learning if you have some uh, real use cases or applications that you can that you can share with us today. Um, yeah. Um... Okay, um, first a general um, use case for, uh, yeah, a general um, small project. If, if you're interested, you can start with them. For example, in quantization is uh, when you want to uh, reduce, uh, quantize the network, you can start, for example, with um, the MNIST net um, um, data set. It's really easy. And the good thing is uh, you can binary size the network uh, really easy or the data. So, um, and because of this, uh, you can really good um, train a binary sized uh, neural network for MNIST. And no, uh, no a real um, project. Um, yeah, there I have two projects. Um, one is from the medicine technique. Um, there in our research institute, we, um, developed an algorithm um, for um, a heart this, um, issue, yeah, and where we, um, yeah, can classify 
and problem with the heart and on an with an ASIC. And um, the classification is um, over 95%, I think. And it's a lot of, and it's in real time. So with only, um, yeah, some microseconds and uh, we only need to classify the um, problem in the heart. And this is really low powered and uh, can be on, it's on a small chip, which should be implemented um, on a small device on the heart, for example. And there we um, use pruning for the um, machine learning model. And we quantize the input data and the whole model, um, I think, into an 8-bit presentation of the data and the network. Uh, yeah, I hope this answers the question. I think so. Thanks, uh, Marcus. There is a more or less a follow-up question from Saiteja. Not sure if I'm pronouncing the, the name correctly, but um, he or she, I'm not sure about that, sorry for that. Um, it's asking about um, if there is any reference for comparing the performance of the different um, algorithms you have shown. Um, can we you repeat the question? Yes. So the question is if there is if you know of any reference to uh, where it is explained or shown a uh, comparison between the different uh, algorithms you have shown, for example, in terms of performance. Um, so if you want a good paper for this, I would say it's deep compression, which uh, compares three of these um, techniques. Um, are the good on the most techniques is you can use them all um, afterwards. And so you can first um, prune the model, uh, you can first use knowledge distillation. After this, you can prune the model. And after this, you can quantize the model. So there's no problem to do every free task um, on one model. So um, there's no need for comparing the techniques because you can use them all. There is no, um, yeah, you must not. Um, use what, um, yeah, the site one. There is no need to choose, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. But if there is, a, um, is there like a, a standard procedure? Which one to try first? Um, there's one, um, yeah, like I said, the, um, the paper deep compression um, have a workflow where it um, prune the model, then it quantize it and yeah, to first prune and then quantize the model. And after this, you can, for example, Huffman code it. So this is the workflow in the paper. My experience, I would say, uh, like I mentioned, first I would um, use knowledge installation if I have enough data. If not, I would go to pruning and after this I would uh, quantize the model. Perfect, thank you. The next question is from Moritz and he's asking, what network sizes are we talking about in the specialist network concept? So first extracting important parts of pictures, then applying second net. Is this still feasible for tiny ML applications? Um, yeah, uh, like I said, this technique is a little bit special because when you have, for example, um, a lot of memory, this is no problem. Um, on the embedded task, um, yeah, there are some, if you have um, extra memory. And um, yeah, the size depends on the application. So what you want to do um, is it, for example, an image um, classification task. Uh, you need a lot of more parameters than a um, predictive maintenance task, for example. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Saptashi, and he's asking, thank you, first of all, thank you for the presentation. I have a question about structured pruning. Is it mandatory to drop the whole neurons or for CNNs, weights, channels, etc., can be pruned? And can we exploit this while implementing in hardware? Um, so, to the question if you can uh, prune whole channels, yeah, that's possible. So in the unstructured pruning, uh, you only um, delete some weights or some 
yeah, weights in the matrix kernel, um, but in the structure pruning, you delete whole channels. And yeah, so you can um, speed up a lot because it does not need um, to inference the um, convolutional. And the other thing is when you, after you done the convolutional layer, you have a flattened layer. So there's not only one parameter who um, is deleted, there are a lot of parameters um, which uh, get deleted. And um, mm. so, yeah, when you pruned your model and um, structured, uh, when you structured pruning your model, you can um, implement in hardware and yeah, there should be no problem because the model is a lot smaller. Okay, thank you. Sai is asking, can you please give an idea in terms of kilobytes or megabytes for the model sizes for a given number of parameters or for the some of the compression factors you have shown? Um, yeah, this is really hard to um, yeah, generalize um, because every application is different and every um, network is different when you have uh, when you are interested, you can have a look at the uh, standard um, standard models like um, ResNet or uh, LeNet or Google Net. Um, I think there must be something like 100 MBs, um, but um, with pruning, you can go up to a tenth of this and you know, uh, yeah. So it really depends on, um, of the, on the application. I can't give you a general uh, answer. Perfect, thank you for that. I think there is, there is quite a lot of questions still, but I'm going to select a couple. So Sanjade is asking um, about the uh, knowledge distillation. Are teacher model and student model from data set what is the effect of convergence and how long to keep both teacher and student together overlay period and time weight ratio? Um, so yeah, you can uh, use for the teacher and student uh, network the same data set. And um, the only thing is that you have every case um, in this data set or the most of the cases. So for example, the MNIST data set, you it's not to, uh, that good that you use in the uh, data set to distill the knowledge all only the numbers from zero to four um, the data set to distill the network should have every number or yeah every case okay um how long it keep it yeah depends how big the networks are so if you uh, have an really big uh, teacher network and a really small student network, it's get a lot of longer. And yeah, knowledge distillation have a big problem with the hyperparameters. So the learning rate and, uh, um, and every other, uh, the optimizer and every other hyperparameter, it's really hard to define. Um, but in the paper I mentioned, or I um, write in the presentation, um, there is a good overview how to find good hyperparameter. Okay, thank you. There are still a couple of questions. One from Atanas. He's saying, first of all, thank you again for the presentation. Do you have any experience with IMET from Qualcomm about quantization? And if yes, would you recommend any or, or suggest any pros and cons? Uh, no, I heard from IMET, but I does not uh, use it. I um, used um, from Embed the system, and but most of the time I use QKeras um, because it's um, really good written the code, and you can be very flexible in this implementation. Yeah, and I think uh, on the on the Qualcomm tool because I am from Qualcomm just. Welcome, Evgeny, to add here. Definitely, this tool has quite a bit of features in terms of quantization and compression. That's kind of the way it was designed. It's a new tool. It, it was made public like a few months back. And if, if you're interested, you can, can send me email. Um, I'll connect me on LinkedIn. I'll connect you guys to the people who do IMEA. There are people in, in Europe, in the Amsterdam office, and also here in the US. 
for experts in, in this in Qualcomm. But this tool is meant to be kind of for the small models, compression, pruning, uh, quantization. That, that's why it was developed uh, for, for all kind of embed, embedded devices. Thank you, Piani. And maybe one last question, Marcus. Um, it's about pruning. Um, what about removing the complete layers, for example, dropout, because they are not running during inference? Um, yeah, so pruning does not remove whole layers because um, the, um, the task um, to look which neurons are um, not important is um, layer-wise. So if you see that you um, overlearn the network, then you can remove the whole level, layer by yourself, but pruning in a normal case does not um, remove whole layers, but it could be possible if the problem is um, not that complex like the, uh, like the model is. Perfect, thank you very much, Markus. So with this, we finish the question and answer. Thank you for the questions. Uh, thanks to you for the great answers. And we would also like to thank ARM as a strategic tiny ML partner. As you probably know, ARM is in fact the software and hardware foundation of uh, tiny ML. And here are the tiny ML talk sponsors, DeepLight, Kitso, Edge Impulse, Reality AI, Maxim Integrated, and Synthens. DeepLight uses AI to make other AI faster, smaller, and more powerful, more power efficient. Edge Impulse is the tiny ML for all developers. Maxim Integrated with the new Max 78000 implements AI inferences at over 100x lower energy than other embedded options. Kitsu brings automated ML to embedded AI. Reality AI has the tools and solutions for building products. And finally, Synsense, which builds ultra low power sensing and inferencing hardware for embedded mobile and edge devices. Once again, reminder about the regular tiny ML talk. So the next one is uh, next week on, on Tuesday. So you are all welcome to join. Um, if you join the meetup group, then you will get automatically um, notifications for the next for the next event. So you know now what to do. And with this, we, we finish for today. Thank you very, very much, uh, especially Marcus and everyone participating in, also in the question and answers. And that's it. Thank you very much. Have a great day.